So antelmintics, for those who are uh, less involved in medical matters in the room, helminths are simply worms. Antelmintics are drugs that we use to treat worms. Antelmintic resistance is simply the state that arises when a proportion of the worms that are picked up from a pasture are no, long, no longer susceptible to that dewormer or the, the antelmintic. So why does resistance develop? Resistance develops because, like every species on Earth, worms are subject to natural selection. So as we impose a selection pressure by killing susceptible worms, we leave the resistant worms behind, those worms reproduce, and progressively we get more and more resistance. So the more we worm, the more resistance we get. So just to give a little historical perspective, in the 1960s, antelmintics were first available for use in horses. In 1985, it was first highlighted that we needed to review how we treated horses, and we needed to discontinue routine deworming of horses. In the 1990s, that became consensus among the profession, uh, and those messages started to permeate. Through, through the 2000s, I think those messages permeated to the end user pretty universally uh, through healthcare providers. Yet despite that, through the 2010s, we've had an increasing body of evidence that we have uh, resistance to every single class of antelmintic that we have for horses, and we only have four. So here we are in 2020. We still have resistance to all those classes because resistance doesn't go away. Once it's there, it's a permanent fixture. And for the first time, we don't have any new classes to turn to. In the past, there's always been a new class under development that we had up our sleeve. Currently, as far as all of us in the profession are aware, there is nothing new to turn to. Most alarming of all, there are now half a dozen or so studies where people are looking at using combined antelmintics. So they're using more than one treatment at the same time out of desperation and possibly to try and slow the development of resistance. But as we do that, we introduce two selection pressures at the same time. We increase the risk that we're generating multiple resistance mechanisms at the same time, and essentially we raise the stakes. So we're on a bit of a slippery slope. And what's at the bottom of that slope is not a very appealing picture, and I personally don't understand why there isn't more discussion about this in the industry. So let's look at our colleagues in the, in the small ruminant sector. There are areas now where sheep farmers have to cope with reduced stocking densities. There are some areas where they cannot keep sheep at all. And there is absolutely no logical reason why the same will not become true for the equine industry. Indeed, it's kept quite quiet, but these issues are already there in parts of the equine industry. And they're only going to get worse over time. So why are we failing? It's, it's humbling. I, I, I feel I'm here giving a negative message after two really positive talks from Zach and Sarah, and hopefully they can change my opinion. But we, we have, we've not done a great job of instilling targeting worming in the end user in, in, among horse owners. We know that if all horse owners implemented targeted deworming, we would reduce the use of antelmintics by 80%. But we've been advocating this for 30 years. Sarah just said it should take 15 years to engender behavior change. We've had twice that window, and the evidence would suggest, and there's plenty of evidence that would suggest, we've only got 0 to 60% of, of horse owners using diagnostics to reduce their deworming. And that's great in theory, but in reality, as few as 10% of those are actually using these diagnostic tests in an appropriate manner and actually targeting treatment properly based on, those results of, on the results of those diagnostics. Add to that, those figures pertain to the respondents to questionnaire surveys. So they're people who are engaged with the subject of deworming. Unfortunately, 90 plus percent of those are the smaller private owners with one or two horses. We consistently fail to engage with the larger owners and the professional owners, and particularly those that have large numbers of young stock. And they are the ones that are at most risk and are already developing multi-drug resistance. So, why are we going wrong? Well, I looked at Sarah's questions from our last presentation. Let's apply those questions to, the, to this subject. Is the problem important and relevant to me? Well, let's look at the evidence. There's plenty of evidence, but I picked the most recent study, which contrary to what everyone is in this room expects, I'm sure, the, this study found that the use of fecal worm egg counts, so diagnostics, was not influenced by perceived risk of antimintics, a resistance, or by the risk of gastrointestinal infection as a result of worms. Why is that? We know there is an interest among horse owners in deworming. We know there's awareness that antimintic resistance is an issue. Unfortunately, though, there is no sense among horse owners looking at the evidence that, there, that is there that implementation of control measures is urgent. And fundamentally, not just in horse owners, but also in farmers, there is a denial that antimintic resistance is going to happen to us. We know it's going to happen, but it's going to happen to somebody else. It's not going to happen to our animals. 
So the second question that Sarah posed, can we trust the information provided? There is no single source of information on how to deworm horses. And the advice is often perceived as conflicting. We, we discussed this this morning with infectious disease. The advice may actually be very similar and all aimed at the same end point. But because this subject is complicated, owners often perceive that they're getting conflicting advice. Um, maybe because it's complicated, Sadly, there are a number of studies to demonstrate that horse owners turn to their peers for information more readily than they'll turn to professionals in this area. And there is a general reluctance to, to seek information. People take deworming for granted. More than 60% of owners claim they know what treatment to use. And around a third state they, they don't need advice. And Sarah just showed us that 35% or so of owners have got no intention of seeking professional advice on what dewormer to use. So uh, maybe that doesn't relate to the quality of the information, but information is not getting through. Third question, are the proposals practical? On small yards, they, or small owners, they probably are. But for the bigger, semi-professional, professional owners, where there are larger groups of horses, where there's mixed ownership, where it's difficult to get horses in from the field, where it's difficult to, to collect feces, it becomes challenging to implement the measures we want to implement. And we know from the data that we've got that once numbers go up, compliance drops. Next question, what commitment is required? Well, Sadly, a lot more commitment to do this properly than just the biantelmintics. We need to understand when to sample, we need to physically get the equipment, we need to do it, we need to post it, we need to discuss the results, and then we go back to where we would be otherwise in considering which wormers to buy and how we're gonna use them for each individual horse. So uh, hopefully Zach's got some amazing tips, but the harsh reality is this is a lot more complicated than the alternative we want people to avoid. The final and most fundamental question, does the change benefit me? Well, there is a little bit of data to suggest that there are financial savings, around 13 pounds per horse, by implementing appropriate diagnostics. But as our diagnostics become more advanced, the price pressure comes on a little bit. So in the short term, there probably isn't a great deal of financial benefit, and that may be outweighed by the hassle of having to do this. And we know from studies that have been done that the cost of diagno diagnostics is a deterrent for horse owners. We also know that professional owners are unwilling to implement these strategies unless they see an immediate health or performance benefit to their horses, and that's not really the object of this exercise. We also, sadly, based on all that evidence, have to conclude that, unfortunately, owners, and I don't exclude myself from this, owners are more motivated by what affects them and what affects their horse. They're not well motivated by what affects the national herd and the population as a whole, and I think influenza last year possibly showed us that as well. So what's going on elsewhere? Well, let's look at Denmark. In Denmark, they introduced prescription-only uh, uh, status, took it a step further than we have in the UK. They were only allowed to prescribe diagnostics on the basis of demonstrable need. Five years after introduction of this status, veterinary involvement in parasite control had increased tremendously, and the uptake of routine fecal worm egg count surveillance had also become widespread. There was a study in 2018 that suggested or confirmed that 45% of Danish owners were treating their adult horses twice or less per year, uh, and the other half were making their decisions based on fecal worm egg count results. So that is really what we would like to see. Let's look at Sweden. In Sweden, in 2007, they used 3,645 kilograms of macrocyclic lactones, benzamidazoles, and pyrantol, the worms, we, the worms we care about in horses. In 2008, they introduced prescription-only status. In 2016, they used 1,445 kilograms of those same worms, a massive 60% reduction in antimintic use over 10 years. Contrast that to the UK. So, I used to pocket my wormers from the pharmacy in the practice. Um, so on Saturday, I put myself in a position of a horse owner and I went online. And I, I, I googled moxidectin, which is the drug that, or the trade name for moxidectin, which is the drug that is the most recent class and the one that we're most keen to protect. I clicked on the link for the cheapest product there. I saw an endorsement that this was the social norm to buy this product, as Zach's already talked about. Other customers were recommending this product. I, I clicked again. I was going to buy 100 just to be provocative. Then I thought, no. Then I thought, no, I'll buy 200. I'll get some for next time. And then I realized I don't need to get any for next time because in complete conflict with all the advice that's out there at the moment, the company is offering me a regular drop plan for my wormers. I add some token data for my imaginary herd of 100 horses. Uh, and I then, I then click and I spend 2,500 pounds on wormers, but clearly I don't. Um, so, so I close my browser, and within seconds, I receive an email saying my basket is still there. I can still complete my order. Not only that, but I receive some, some, some peer group pressure to buy other wormers for other species, um, confirming everything Zach's told us about what marketeers do. I close that email. 
The next day, I receive a similar email encourage, encouraging me to buy other antimintics for other species and other antimintics for horses, which clearly I don't need because I've just brought 200 tubes for two horses. <laughs> but as a vet, I find that thoroughly demoralizing. Um, and I, I actually realize that I too am human, and the same questions actually apply to me. So, is the problem important and relevant to me? Well, yes, it is. I'm a vet. I don't like treating horses that come in with parasite-related disease. And I, I see an Armageddon on the horizon that I'm anxious to avoid. Can I trust the information provided? Well, I'm looking mostly at the scientific literature, and there is a plethora of literature to support what I'm telling you here today, even if this isn't widely talked about within the industry. So are the proposed changes practical to me as a vet? Is it practical for me to work hard to get owners to change what they do? Well, yes it is, but it's an awful lot of work and therefore an awful lot of personal commitment is required both from me and my colleagues in trying to get owners to change. It is sadly an awful lot easier just to sell Antel Mintix. How does it benefit me and my business? Well, if I'm being really frank, it doesn't. We would be far better off sticking with the old system of dispensing antimintics. That isn't the right thing to do, but there is no benefit in, to me in my, benef in my business in the same way as there isn't to the horse owner as a person individually, for now, in implementing change. I also feel as professionals, we're, we're facing a point of diminishing returns. We've been, we've been pushing this message, possibly badly, listening to all Zach's tips and advice earlier on. Um, but I think we've done a reasonable job, and a lot of us have been doing it and trying to do it in different ways. We've been doing it for decades, and we've not been winning. We've been preaching to the, to the minority, and the silent majority are carrying on doing what they're doing. So we can put in more effort, but I suspect we're not going to see a great deal of return. And sadly, I don't think with this subject we're even up there that high on that graph. I think we're, we're down the bottom, the evidence would suggest. So I'm going to appeal to the industry for help. There are an awful lot of stakeholders represented in this room. There are a lot of stakeholders on that slide. And this, this issue is going to permeate our industry very quickly. And therefore, it is an industry-wide problem to try and solve it. I possibly come across as slightly defeatist, but I know the view is shared by a lot of uh, healthcare professionals that we aren't going to see real change unless we have some degree of regulation, some degree of restriction on prescribing, uh, in addition to voluntary behaviour change. I, I stand to be corrected by Zach, but I don't see with this issue how we're going to get there any other way. So there are some difficult questions ahead. I think our regulators have to, have to think laterally, have to be proactive, and have to embrace this challenge. Now, this is a sticky issue. It's very complicated. There are a lot of different stakeholders who aren't necessarily all pulling in the same direction currently. And there, there are many bits of this jigsaw. But we are going to have to think smart. We're going to have to embrace diagnostics more. We're going to have to restrict antelmintics uh, to encourage the use of those diagnostics. We're going to have to start thinking about clinical audit to make sure this is happening, both at a healthcare provider level and also at a horse owner level. And along with that, we have to start educating people more effectively. So there is an awful lot to consider in this. We have to consider that diagnostics aren't freely available through non-veterinary channels. We also have to consider that only vets can start using, uh, can use antimintics off-label, which we already have to do. And we're going to have to embrace the use of extemporaneous non-regulated medicines to, to overcome the problems we face with not having enough drugs that are effective. So all these challenges face our industry. So we can either face up to them, or sadly, we have to accept the fact that we are going to return to the situation we had in the 1950s, when we had restricted stocking densities because we couldn't keep horses intensively as we, as we do now. And this is already starting to happen in the industry. And we also have to face the fact that we are going to see more and more horses like this that are dying from intestinal-related colic. Thank you.